Okay, welcome back. We are going to continue our study of the space-time algebra as a powerful tool of electromagnetism. We're going through this wonderful paper, and we last time got as far as the Lorentz group, which is basically penetrating the subject of relativity. Um, this is synonymous with relativity, and we basically found the Lorentz group buried inside the space-time algebra, and that was a really, really important and exciting topic. So today we are going to then finish up this section three. Well, we're not going to finish up all of 3.7. We're going to go, we're finishing this section right here that begins on page 41. And we are going to do a full example of a Lorentz transformation using uh, the rotors, at, understanding that the Lorentz group can be translated into rotors. That's what we learned last time. We're going to actually demonstrate this for a true boost. Uh, the paper actually demonstrated it for a rotation but we're going to demonstrate it for a boost now. Well, the paper did both. We're covering the papers. Uh, the pa we had already studied the rotation form of it, but now we're going to go into deep detail on the boost form, and we're going to really dissect the whole process. And uh, so let's begin. So in our last lesson, we looked at how all of these bivectors, these are every bivector basis combination, and we form all of their commutation relations. And this, this is half of them, of course, because we can flip, we can take any two and reverse them and just get the negative of, of the same commutation relation in uh, reverse order. But looking at this, it's just a bunch of rules, right? It's a bunch, it's a, it's a bunch of calculations, right? Because this can be calculated using geometric algebra. Uh, and uh, following the prescription, and remember there's an extra one half in this prescription, so this isn't strictly the commutator of quantum mechanics, but you can, with these simplifications here, right, with calling S1 gamma 2 3, S2 gamma 3 1, and S3 gamma 1 2, and then giving these 1 2 and 3, turning them into indices, turning them into indices, we end up with these commutation relations as a whole, which anybody who studied special relativity uh, immediately recognizes as generators of the Lorentz group. And generators of the Lorentz and generators of the Lorentz group we know uh, are generate the, uh, the well the Lorentz group is what uh, uh, gives us our Lorentz transformations for our vector space. So with that in mind, now we are going to apply this fact and we are going to run an example. And the example is expressed, oh, then actually, then after that, we studied this expression in detail, understanding that this term here is understood as an operator. So this is sort of an operator expression, but it blows up into this power series. And then we look closely at this power series to understand why is it that we can rewrite this power series as this left and right, uh, ro uh, well, as this rotor equation? It's basically a rotor equation, right? You see you have this rotor, uh, this theta over 2 S3 and, uh, and theta over 2 S3 on the left and the right with a minus sign. We know that that is a rotor operating on a multivector F. Now, in our case here, F is a bivector. Right, and we definitely know S three is a bivector, right? We know it because, boy, at this point we better. Well, I guess that's a slightly new thing, right? S three stands for this particular bivector, gamma one two, and gamma one two is the bivector that would represent rotations in the one two plane, right? But it doesn't really matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter which of the. Uh, uh, generators goes here. This formula is true, right? This exponentiation, right? the exponentiation, that is the group element, right? This is the group element operating on this to give us the rotated form of F, right? So we would have like F prime equals this. And the it turns out that the equivalent of taking that rotation operator and acting on a multivector is the same as executing this rotor expression, right, which is, which is, um, 
uh, which is uh, R, F, R, reversion, right? And uh, when you substitute for S3 in and put it in f the form where we include this relative vector, right? Uh, you have to add that, that I in there. So it's I sigma 3. So that is uh, what we studied last time. And we skipped this part about quaternions because we had already done that previously. But now we're going to look at this paragraph right here. So let's begin right here. Okay, so another important and enlightening example of the Lorentz group is the boost from a frame with time-like vector gamma zero to a different frame moving at a relative velocity of v, which is given by a little vector, magnitude v, uh, sigma three. So that first sentence, very important that we catch up on a few ideas. First of all, when we define our frame of reference, right, we're moving, we're boosting from a frame with this time-like vector. Establishing and asserting gamma zero is the same thing as asserting what frame you're in. The other vectors, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, are important too. I mean, they all define the frame. But, but we focus on gamma 0 because that defines the time-like vector. So if you're at rest in that frame, you are moving only in the gamma 0 direction, right? So that's why we, we lean on gamma 0 to define the frame. Um, but we want to boost from this gamma 0 frame to a frame moving at this relative velocity. So if you're sitting in the gamma zero frame and you're motionless, you should see something moving along at the speed magnitude v heading in the z direction. That's what this gamma three or the sigma three is saying. It's the, it's the uh, z direction. And we have to remember though that in the space-time algebra, sigma three is a bivector, right? Sigma three equals, equals gamma three gamma zero. So when I say you're heading in the sigma three direction, I'm kind of, I'm leaning on the fact that you remember that inside the space-time algebra, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, the set, those set of those three bivectors, which would be, you know, gamma one, gamma zero, gamma two, gamma zero, and gamma three, gamma zero, the set of those three bivectors actually forms a three-dimensional space-time algebra where this represents the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So you really have to keep track of that. That relative, those are what we call the relative vectors inside the space-time algebra. So uh, remember, this is a bivector, but it represents motion in the z direction. So we have, we want to boost from the frame we're in to a frame moving at a certain velocity in our z direction. So then they say, recall that a relative vector such as v, right, it's a relative vector. When they use the word relative in space-time algebra, they're reminding us that we're going to give it a basis of these sigmas, which is this relative space-time, uh, this, I'm sorry, did I write 3D space-time algebra? I meant 3D just algebra, right? It's just 3D algebra. Uh, uh, geometric algebra, because the, you, the metric of this algebra is Euclidean. It's not Minkowskian in any way. So it's just a 3D geometric algebra. But anyway, um, uh, so uh, the point is, is that uh, this thing is really a bivector, which is just what I said. Now they write gamma three wedge gamma zero. I wrote gamma three gamma zero, but it's the same and just can't help remind you, right, why not go through it? Gamma 3, gamma 0 is gamma 3 dot gamma 0 plus gamma 3 wedge gamma 0. But because they're orthonormal by definition, this piece is 0. So I can write that or that, and I'm okay. And so he chose to write it with the, the wedge. It's really a bivector, so it can directly act as a generator for the appropriate Lorentz boost. That's going back to this material up here where we understand that, hey, this is all the bivectors you could have. These are the basis vectors for every single bivector. So any bivector is written in this basis, but that can be translated into these generators, and these generators form the, basically the, uh, 
the algebra of the Lorentz group. And when we exponentiate these generators, we get an element of the Lorentz group. And each element of the Lorentz group is a transformation that can take uh, whatever, is being, and whatever the representation is, usually vectors, to other vectors. Well, it's always vectors, but it's a question of how you represent the vectors. And in our case, we're representing vectors inside the uh, geometric algebra. But the point is, is that any bivector can represent uh, uh, a rotation in uh, this geometric algebra space that is a Lorentz group element. Now, some are just rotations. These S's are just rotations, and some are true boosts, like the one we're going to do in a moment. So, uh, getting back to it, um, indeed, note that the relative unit vector sigma 3, which is gamma 3, 0, oh, interesting. In this case, he, the author chose to just use the geometric product instead of the uh, wedge product, which is fine. I mean, you, you should use those interchangeably. Um, is also equal to the boost generator. So the the re, it's now it's the boost generator because it's K three right. The uh, we'll we'll see exactly why it's boost generators in a moment, but it's or, or soon enough. But it's the, any any of the ones that have a gamma zero in it, which means our relative vectors will generate boosts. And the reason is because these objects, these guys with the uh, with the gamma zeros in it they square to positive one, not negative one. And because of that, they produce a hyperbolic geometry. Okay, but, uh, we'll, and, and we'll demonstrate that uh, in a moment. The proper hyperbolic angle, the ra rapidity, right? Because we are now going to rotate in the, in the sigma three plane, in the, in the gamma three, gamma zero plane. The, the Lorentz boost is going to represent a rotation in that plane. Uh, this is all about rotations, right? If you rotate in a spatial plane, or you rotate in uh, the time-like plane. And here we're going to rotate in one of these time-like planes. And, uh, but we need to know how much you're going to rotate. Well, you know that the rotation has to touch this, right? This velocity, this magnitude of velocity has to, uh, the rotation has to be enough to make the boost exactly match this velocity. So it has to be a connection between the rotation angle alpha, right? This rotation angle alpha, or this rotation angle alpha, right? These rotation angles, well, they're all the same angle, but has to somehow connect to the velocity. And if you, this is where you, where they start in this paper, leaning on the fact that you know special relativity well enough to understand the notion of rapidity and the hyperbolic nature of Minkowski geometry, right? They assume that you understand this, and that's fine. That's a very fair assumption, I think. But the, hyper, the hyperbolic angle, there is only one angle out there that does this. It's called the rapidity, and it should be pretty familiar uh, to anybody who's done this work. And uh, they give that angle as the hyperbolic inverse tangent of V over C, which would be beta. This is V over C is beta typically in relativity. So while the proper plane of rotation is simply the relative unit vector itself, right? This is, again, this is a plane. This is a bivector, so it represents a plane element. So the active Lorentz boost that rotates a bivector f from v back into the reference frame gamma zero has this form. Here are the key word that I want to focus you on. It could easily blow through it, but this is active, right? We're rotating the bivector we're not rotating the reference frame, which would be a passive Lorentz boost. And that's totally op, uh, given by a sign change, right? A different sign. So, um, all right, so there you have it. Uh, this is the expression we're going to work with. And notice it's the, identical to the one we did before, except now uh, we are dealing with K3 instead of S. Now, I want to make sure something's pretty clear. We're dealing with an expression like this, right? So we're going to open it up using Euler's formula. But something to keep in mind is that sigma 3 squared, in a geometric sense, right, is going to be gamma 3, gamma 0, gamma 3, gamma 0, and 
And because of the Minkowski metric being such as it is, we're going to make these things will anti-commute because they're orthonormal. And we'll get gamma 3, gamma 3, gamma 0, gamma 0 with a minus sign. And then the gamma 3, gamma 3 will turn into another minus 1. And so we will end up with gamma 0, gamma 0, which in our metric is equal to 1. So sigma 3 squares to positive 1. It does not square to negative 1, right? It does not square to negative 1. So this guy does not equal cosine alpha over 2 plus sigma 3 sine alpha over 2, right? Because in order for that to be the case, this object in here has to act like the imaginary number i to, to make that analogy complete. But it doesn't act. It is an object that squares to 1, not an object that squares to negative 1. On the other hand, it's not 1 itself. So this is another, sigma 3 is another mathematical object that actually squares to 1. So this is not right. However, when you do the expansion of an object that squares to 1 that's in the exponential like this, like we have in our situation, the real answer is just the hyperbolic cosine of alpha over 2 plus the hyperbolic sine of alpha over 2 uh, plus the hyperbolic sine of alpha over 2 times sigma 3. So it becomes hyperbolic. That's the difference in this Euler form if you have an object here that mathematically squares to positive 1 instead of negative 1. You end up with this hyperbolic piece, right? Or, or turns into this hyperbolic thing, which is, which is good, right? Because we know that the Lorentz geometry, this Minkowski geometry, is a hyperbolic geometry. Now, had we done this rotation in, uh, had, had we actually done a spatial rotation, right? we would have rotated by a different object. We would have rotated by, as we saw previously, um, uh, uh, what was it? It was S3, right? Which was sigma 3 i inverse. Well, let's do that one. Sigma 3 i inverse squared. So that would have been the object in here, right? Well, sigma 3 i inverse, sigma 3 I inverse. Well, in, uh, in geometric algebra, we remember the fact that I commutes with anything of even grade in our geometric algebra. So sigma 3 I inverse equals I inverse sigma 3. So this can be rewritten. And the reason we write that is because I inverse is just minus i, right? So you would get i, i inverse would equal minus i squared, which is equal to 1, right? So this guy equals minus, let's see, it's, it's minus sigma 3, because the i inverse is cancel out, and then these two guys square to minus 1, right? Uh, sigma 3, which is minus gamma 3, gamma 0, gamma 3, gamma 0, where we flip the 2 on the inside, and we generate a minus sign, which cancels with the 1 out in front. So that gives us, that gives us uh, gamma 3, gamma 3, gamma 0, gamma 0. These guys give us a 1 because of the Minkowski metric. These guys give us a minus 1, so it equals minus 1. Okay, so that just shows us that if we had put this guy in here, it's something that squares to minus 1. So it does act like the uh, standard uh, complex number from complex analysis. And now it is true that you have, instead of the hyperbolic cosine, you have the sine and cosine. So regular rotations do actually have cosine and sine, but these rotations in planes that involve gamma zero, right, um, with, without this I inverse, right, that, that would be the generators that are defined as K, they give us this hyperbolic stuff. 
And that's exactly what we expect, right? We expect special relativity to have a hyperbolic geometry when we're dealing with boosts. Okay, so now back to the main line of discussion. So we expect this to give us a hyperbolic, uh, a hyperbolic Euler expansion, and likewise this will give us a hyperbolic Euler expansion on both sides of F. So we could actually do that now, um, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And I think this is what you get, right? You take our expression. That is the right expression, right? Mm, yes, yes. Uh, the minus sign is on the uh, left side, right? So you get this minus sign here from this minus sign there, and you just blow this thing up, and you end up with this. Now, notice you have uh, this bivector product, because we're going to play that f is a bivector for right now. Um, and then you have this bivector product here and here, and then the bivector stands alone there. And all of these hyperbolic sines and cosines representing the angle. So you could calculate this, right? This equals, this is what f prime, this is the, the new expression of this guy in the new frame. And you could calculate this, right? Because you know the bivector, you know this bivector. The only thing we don't know is this angle. The way I play it, you don't know this angle. Um, but we actually do know the angle. It's the inverse hyperbolic tangent of V over C, or beta, as we would call it. Okay, so this is just the literal expansion. So let's go back to our expression here. Again, the conversion of the exponential computator to a double-sided product makes the expression simpler. Right, so yeah, that's pretty simple, I suppose. Note that the only difference in form between the boost 3.57 and the spatial rotation 3.55 is the factor of i in the exponent that changes the signature of the space-time rotation. Yeah, I just went through that, right? That's, that is, this paragraph here represents, uh, what was it? Where was it? Um, that represents this whole story that I just told right here with the difference between trigonometric functions and hyperbolic functions. Now, what the paper does is they don't do what I just did, which is this straight-up expansion. They say, hey, we're going to simplify this even further because we're going to split f into a parallel part and a perpendicular part. The parallel part um, will be, it'll be relative to v, right? Now, remember, v is a plane, right? It looks like a little vector and representing a direction, and it kind of does, right? It represents motion in the z direction. But in geometric algebra, it's a bivector. So V represents a plane. So F represents a plane because it's a bivector as well. So we're talking about the portion of one plane that is perpendicular to another plane and parallel to another plane. So we know that F, F is the sum of its parallel and perpendicular piece where we're talking about parallel and perpendicular to the plane the, the gamma zero, gamma one plane, right? And so that can be done. And, but when we do that, we know that the parallel part will uh, commute with the bivector, the, 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 the bivector piece of F that is parallel to the bivector V will commute with V, but the perpendicular part will anti-commute, right? We've done that, we've done that before. We've shown that these, we've talked about how the, uh, when you when you look at these bivectors and these geometric part products, commutation and anti-commutation isn't clear, except in the cases where they're parallel or perpendicular. When they're parallel, they commute. When they're perpendicular, they anti-commute. So what they do is they take, okay, here, here's our basic form, but they're going to blow this up into the parallel and perpendicular parts. So what that ends up being is this becomes... Oops. This becomes f parallel plus f perpendicular. And since f parallel commutes with sigma 3, sigma 3 is v, right? v is some number v times sigma 3. So the parallel part commutes, so it just moves immediately to the left, the parallel part does, the f parallel part moves to the left, 
And then what's left behind is this, right? The parallel part is gone and this, and those just cancel out. So the parallel part just ends up being F parallel, unaffected by the rotation. The perpendicular part, however, anti-commutes. So the perpendicular part now, if you blow this thing uh, up a little bit, if we have F perpendicular in there, when you move that over here, you anti-commute with, uh, well, let's see, wait, wait, how do I want to move it? No, oh, I want to move it the other way. I want to move it the other way to, to be consistent with their notation. So we want to take F and move it over here, which will generate a minus sign on this because of anti-commutation. Now, if you're wondering, well, hey, wait a minute, this guy's in the exponent, right? Don't forget, this exponent is 1 uh, plus, it, it's, a, it's a power series, right? So you're actually commuting or anti-commuting with each of these guys, right? So, uh, so the, the, that translates into just throwing the minus sign right up in the top where, where it is. So we, we make that anti-commutation. We end up with putting the minus sign up here and F perpendicular comes over to the right. And then you have this expression here times that expression there, which is just adding the exponents together. And so the two goes away and you have just the uh, exponential without the two in the denominator. So now um, what, they, what they do next is they plug in their substitution for alpha, right? They have minus hyperbolic tangent of V over C. And then if you know your hyperbolic tangent, your hyperbolics well enough, you now understand that if you blow this up, right, if you blow up this, hyper, this exponential using the uh, Euler form, right, you get this hyperbolic cosine of the hyperbolic tangent of V over C and the hyperbolic sine of the hyperbolic tangent of V over C, where this minus sign here comes from this minus sign here, right, this gets put over there, right? And if you play with this enough and you understand the, uh, the definitions of things, you end up with this expression here. And that basically comes from the fact that, uh, let's see, how does it go? Well, let me see it. The rapidity equals the hyperbolic cosine of V over C, which is beta, by the way, that's beta. Um, no, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 I'm sorry, not the, not the rapidity. Gamma, right? The, the, uh, the relativistic factor gamma is the hyperbolic cosine of V over C. Beta times gamma is actually the hyperbolic sine of V over C. And, uh, and I think that means beta must be, yeah, of course, beta equals the hyperbolic tangent of V over C, right? And so the inverse tangent of V over C is, okay, that's better. Yeah, it's the rapidity here. I had V over C here, which is beta, but beta is the hyperbolic tangent of the rapidity. Beta gamma is the hyperbolic sine of the rapidity. Gamma is the hyperbolic cosine of the rapidity. Okay. So with these substitutions, you can deduce what this is. The inverse hyperbolic tangent of V over C is the rapidity. So this is the cos, the hyperbolic cosine of the rapidity. Likewise, this is the hyperbolic sine of the rapidity. So using this rubric, we replace, let's see, what do we do? We replace the hyperbolic cosine of the rapidity, we replace that simply with gamma, and the hyperbolic sine we replace with beta gamma, and gamma, so we have beta gamma sigma three, so then you have gamma, let's see, we have gamma minus beta gamma sigma three, which equals gamma one minus beta sigma three, right? But beta sigma three is V, magnitude of V over C sigma three, but this combination is just the vector V. 
So that's how this, so ultimately this expression here ends up being one over the square root of one minus magnitude of V over C quantity squared minus, uh, uh, minus magnitude of V over C divided by the square root of one minus the magnitude of V over C quantity squared, which is just one minus uh, times sigma three, right? Times sigma three, which is one minus uh, the magnitude of V over C sigma three to over the square root of one minus the magnitude of V over C squared, right? And this simplifies to one, you, you can, you now combine these parts here, oops, you combine this here to make the velocity vector, and you get one minus the velocity vector over C, uh, square root of one minus magnitude of V over C quantity squared, right? Which is exactly what they have right here. So, so that explains how this vector V returns into this expression, right? <clears throat> this vector V comes back in because this sigma three combines with the uh, beta that shows up with the hyperbolic sign. Okay, so that's pretty good. And now what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, okay, um, we know that the parallel part remains unchanged. The perpendicular part is scaled by this factor here, which is uh, one minus beta over one minus beta times gamma, basically, and uh, which is what they, and then what do they do? So then they say, okay, let's drive this all the way into our electromagnetism thinking. So now what they're going to say is, let's say F is our electromagnetic field bivector. Well, we know that the electromagnetic field bivector has a relative, uh, has a space-time split of the electric part and the magnetic part. And the electric part, that's a reminder, right? The electric part is just the part that is expressed in the basis sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, which is in the basis gamma 1, 0, gamma 2, 0, gamma 3, 0, right? That's the definition of those things. And this beta is still a relative vector, meaning it's also expressed in this basis. But this I here takes the dual of all of that stuff. So you're now going to have gamma 1, 2, gamma 2, 3, gamma 3, 1 uh, mixed in there. So this part is in the dual basis of this stuff, and this part is in the, the relative basis. All right, so with that, um, with that split, and you can do that split, right? This is, this is a bivector, so you can always, so it's expressible in the full basis of the space-time algebra, which is all gamma gamma one zero gamma two zero gamma three zero gamma one two gamma two three gamma three one so you just split it up that way and then you take the guys that are not in the relative basis and you make them sort of their dual forms so once you do that you rewrite this expression here right but what they're going to do is they're going to take this guy right here and that's what this is right right there and you now have this, uh, you, you, you take this denominator and you wrap it up in gamma up there and you leave the numerator alone, right? And then you proceed to uh, make this, this substitution, right? The, the substitution right here. And then you make this final step, which is kind of fun. So the final step sort of blows this thing up and breaks it down using some, uh, some cleverness. So let's do that. And the first step is we write this down. We write down gamma, one minus beta. Now remember, beta is kind of a vector here, right? So I probably should put this on because beta actually is defined by the vector V, right? The vector V over C, right? So there should be a little vector there. Let me, let me just put them in where they belong. Um, I, I guess I made the substitution here already, right? And that vector, uh, you know, comes from our prior formula, right? And the reason I do that is this is a bivector, right? Beta is now a bivector because V 
Remember V, the definition of that, I guess, if you really wanted to go out, is magnitude of V, sigma 3 over C. And just a quick reminder, sigma 3 is because we're boosting in the Z or the sigma 3 direction or rotating in the gamma 3, 0 plane, right? It's, this isn't some general formula, of course. And uh, so now we can expand this, right? The gamma will just sort of stay out front. You get the perpendicular uh, E is scaled by gamma. Then you have uh, V over C times the perpendicular V. Now, B is a bivector, right? And beta is a bivector. So this is a geometric product right here. This guy here is a geometric product of V and B, right? Likewise, you have a geometric product of V and E there, right? And then in the end, you have uh, uh, a scaling by gamma of the perpendicular part. And, uh, but I don't think there's a minus sign there. I think that minus sign is wrong. It should be a plus sign. Okay, so this is the expression when you just sort of blow it up. So how can we simplify this expression? Well, let's start by examining just this electric terms first. We scale the perpendicular part of the electric field, then we subtract off a scaled portion of this bivector product. So what do we remember about bivector products? Well, there's a formula, right? So, the form, so, so when you take the uh, bivector, geomet the geometric product of two bivectors, in our case, V and E, we're going to write it down as... Uh, V and E, that's a now a vi or E perpendicular vi vector product. It is the zero component of V dot E plus this commutator, this what I call the half commutator, and then it's the V dot E. Uh, grade 4 component. Now, V dot E, right, that, well, first of all, you can just say, well, by definition, E is perpendicular to V. That's what this perpendicular means. So V dot E is going to be zero. So this term and that term are just going to go away. But you could also understand that, hey, that is defined as uh, V E perp plus E perp V, and then times one half, right? And then you realize, oh, because these are orthogonal, they anti commute, and this term goes to zero. So, either way, either if you meant, remember this fundamental definition or if you just look at this dot product, the uh, anti commutivity because of the orthogonality of E and V come into play. So this goes away, and this goes away, leaving us just with this center piece. Now, the center piece, by definition, now, the center piece, by definition, is one-half times V E perp minus E perp V, right, which is in our notation defined as V cross E perp. And you might remember that expression from previous work in our paper. I'll go back to it if I can find it. Um, uh, it was right here, right? We had this definition. Uh, to the, uh, we define the cross product of two bivectors is this commutator bracket times this inverse i. So, obviously I forgot this uh, inverse i here. Let me fix that. This inverse i times i inverse. So the, so the point is the pure commutator bracket which is what we're after, because that's all that's left of this geometric product, that's going to look like V cross E times I, right? I'm going to multiply both sides by I, 
right? And I'm going to, uh, and then this will, of course, be 1, and that will be what this commutator bracket equals. So this guy up here is in our notation V cross E perpendicular I. And we can put that, uh, we can put that right here. So let me do that. Okay, and then, um, then we have to deal with the, uh, the magnetic terms, but they're just sort of the same, right? It's going to be plus the scaled part of B perpendicular times I um, minus gamma, and then you'll have the same thing. It'll be minus gamma V over C cross uh, B perpendicular times I times I, right? Right, you're going to have this structure. Um, I'm actually putting this stuff all on the same line, so let me do this again. Gamma B perpendicular minus, and then this I times I is minus 1, so you're going to get a plus uh, gamma V vector over C cross B perpendicular. I feel like I'm missing an I somewhere. There should be two I's. Oh, yeah, yeah. This has an I right there. So uh, we can combine these together. We can combine in, uh, the terms that are dual and the terms that are not, the relative vectors and the dual to the relative vectors. And that would give us gamma E perpendicular as a relative vector. And let's just take the gamma out, plus V over C B perpendicular, and then we have a plus, and again we'll take out the gamma, and we have um, uh, da, 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 uh, V over C, I'm sorry, this is V over C cross B perpendicular, then we have gamma um, V over C cross E perpendicular plus gamma B perpendicular times I, okay? And let's see if this agrees with what they got. Uh, no, there's a minus sign I just checked, so I'm not, I didn't bring this minus sign down correctly, so, v, so this should have a minus sign here, and I think that's good. And let me quickly point out before we move on that these cross products that you see here, which we've defined in this, this way up here, right? We have this definition for these cross products where these are, this is a bivector uh, operation. However, in the relative basis, right? When we're dealing with the relative basis vectors, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, when I write these cross products, they will translate exactly to the style of cross product that we're so familiar with in regular Gibbsian algebra. That's why they were defined this way. That's why they chose this notation. So when I look at this cross product, I can now write this as the relative bivector, and this is the relative bivector. And they are relative bivectors. V is literally a direction of motion in space. So you know it's restricted to having only these three different, I should have commas here, I guess, these three different um, uh, basis vectors, gamma 1, 0, gamma 2, 0, gamma 3, 0. And E is, by definition, a vector written with gamma 1, gamma 2, uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So uh, if you just wrote them out in that form and took the normal cross product you would do of an x, y, and z of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 as though they were regular spatial vectors, you'd get the right answer. So that's uh, an important point to keep in mind is when we, we translate this back uh, to regular physics, these definitions were chosen so that, that this cross product translation would make sense. Uh, look at this, this perpendicular, how horrible. Let me move this whole thing over to the actual paper so we can compare it. Let's see, the paper is right here. Put it up there. So here's, here's our version. 
uh, gamma e perp, so that term matches this term, and minus, uh, plus v over c b perp with a gamma, um, that term matches this term, so that's good. And gamma b perp, of course, well, I wrote gamma gamma b perp, but th that gamma should go away, right? I have two gammas there. I didn't distribute it. I didn't distribute the gamma I had sitting here out front, so that's good. And then this minus sign comes down, so that's good. And these guys are all, these guys all have this factor of i. Okay, so we get it. So now the idea is, well, we look at this, right? We look at th this final expression here. And we say, well, you know, we've, we've seen that before. When we studied elementary relativity, we know that the electromagnetic field transforms in a way where the parallel part is unaffected, but the perpendicular part is transformed by the Lorentz transformation in this fashion. And this is familiar, and so we know, oh, we've generated this through geometric algebra. And that's what this last paragraph says. Um, this last paragraph here just points out the fact that, oh, hey, look, we've come back home. Um, okay, so um, so the next section goes into this thing called the spinner representation. However, I'm going to call a bit of an audible, and we're going to move into a book written by, or a, a, a paper written by Duran for a little while. And we're going to cover a few more topics in special relativity maybe one more lecture just covering some special relativity topics, maybe two. This is good. This is an example of a Lorentz transformation. That's fine. But there are some other little topics in special relativity. I just, I'll take Duran's paper and we'll just go through a little bit of it just so you can get the feel of how geometric algebra sits with special relativity. And then we will uh, press on. All right, see you next time.